it is so stark in the beginning here. He says that the human as a being is a really pointless and treacherous, treacherous category, a category which has never meant anything to African Americans. Now, this is quite a statement to make because, of course, Ishan is not African American. Um, he's British Ghanaian. But he goes on to say, this is particularly true with Sun Ra, just because Ra pushes it by saying that he comes from Saturn. I always accept the impossibility of this. So this is the nut right here. What does it mean to accept impossibility? Now, if you're schooling the history of 20th century European philosophy, accepting impossibility is a pretty big concept. It's right there in all of major white European figures and a Jewish Algerian type, Pierre Noir, and the Frenchman and Jacques Derrida, um, who I do not count as a European, thank you very much. <laughs> um, accepting impossibility, bursting through the impossible. The impossible happens all around us all the time. That's key, I think, to understanding what Afrofuturism is and why it's happening. And he, goes, and he goes on to say, this is not an allegory. Sun Ra is not allegorically speaking about coming from Saturn. So um, in my own work, I've tried to address this concept of allegory and metaphor and try to push past concepts like allegory and metaphor. So what does it mean then to accept Ra? Well, John Corbett actually has an essay, an extended play from 1994 that doesn't get a lot of play, <laughs> um, where he also talks about this. And uh, he, he says that you know, we, we have to, this acceptance of this impossible suggestion of outer space origins. So he says, this is an essential component of any serious consideration. He also makes this, this claim. And the big question is here, why? Okay, why? Why do we have to accept this? Well, <laughs> Mark Sinker. I think um, summarizes it really nicely by turning to public enemy. To the public enemy who really make this happen. They say the central fact in black science fiction, self-consciously so named or not, this is before the term after futures and comes around, is an acknowledgement that apocalypse already happened, that in public enemy's phrase, Armageddon is going to be in effect. Um, now this is pretty much the the whole thesis that if you've already been abducted by aliens from a strange land and brought to a place from which you do not come then you are not only post-apocalyptic, you are already alien, in a sense. The question is, how does one respond to such a profound socioeconomic, structural, white supremacist form of alienation? Um, this, the Afrofuturist reply, I think, is to own it. <laughs> to make it alien nation. To break up alienation, that very concept, into two separate words, and make it the alien nation. Mm -hmm. Um, and Sun Ra, in a poem that really deserves its own exegesis and a really intense ideological analysis, says, I am not a fantasy in a real sense, I am a fantasy in a false sense. And really, <laughs> yet I exist, and that yet, the, the power of that yet, yet I exist. I stand here before you as the living myth that walks the earth, right? So what he's really getting at here is, again, I'm just gonna reference some larger European thinkers, because they also come out of that tradition. <laughs> Zizek thinks about ideology this way. Ide ideology is not the sunglasses, um, you take off to see the real, right? You don't take off the blinders to see the real. You put the sunglasses on. Yeah. Right? Already <laughs> 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 understand the concept. Right? <laughs> so you, you would expect Sun Ra to say, I'm a fantasy in a false sense. Like, no. Or, or you, you would expect him to say, I'm a fantasy in a real sense. Like, I'm a real fantasy. No. Reality is that which has already been constructed for you, given to you, but it's a construct. And so when you intervene in the construct of reality as the given, you are a fantasy in a false sense. So it's actually inverting the sort of commonly held thinking. So he's, what I get out of this right away is this is an extraordinarily sophisticated thinker around the concept of ideology. Um, someone who's making an argument in three lines that in philosophy you write entire books about trying to convince people. <laughs> This is uh, Public Enemy Live in London from 1988. I mean, I don't know if any other hip hop acts are still open at this top power. Um, about Beyonce's formation performance. <laughs> I mean, when you rewind to like, Public Enemy, like, like the 
hear the first world dancers dressed up as you know Black Panthers coming on stage with the siren blaring, saying you know like quoting Jill Scott Heron and like laying it down. And I mean, in a way, we there is there has not been progress since that moment. Like we we are in, we are very caught in a very interesting time. Here. But um, so why should we affirm Ra's becoming alien? Okay, well John Corbett also gives us an answer. It's the same one as Mark Singer and the same one as Public Enemy. Um, this extraterrestrial metaphor, if it can be considered a metaphor, I don't. Uh, may indicate the insanity of its maker. It also cuts back the other direction, suggesting the fundamental unreality of existence of people imported into the new world's history and then disenfranchised from poverty. So the given existence of the world. Um, now this this go, this goes on, and we start to get into the concept of race as a technology. Now this is the second phrase that I'm starting to see pop up quite a bit. We, we, we all sort of have worked through the concept of race as a, as a social construct, you know, it's, it's, it's a historical construct, it's been historically constructed by white supremacy in both biological and um, metaphysical and philosophical modes, structural modes of discrimination and like so on. Um, but race as a technology, well I need to pause over that because I'm not exactly sure what that means. What does it really mean, race as a technology? Technics, techno, logos, discourse around technics, what is actually technics? That's a deep philosophical question for philosophers of technology. It's this sense of the tech of a of a kind of a materialist infrastructure that underlines conceptual uh, di uh, di uh, distinctions. And as technologies, these things change. Our ideas change in turn, and the relationship between this and this is a complicated or reciprocal relationship with philosophers taking different sides as to whether this piece of technology completely determines the outcome of my thought and or whether my thought because it creates this technology is the other way around and we end up debating it for a long time but as soon as we start thinking about race as a technology about people who have been under a white supremacist structure deliberately engineered or the attempt to engineer a race of what we now call robots right and if you think about the origins of the term robot under Karl Kapek, he invented that term as a metaphor for this like that's the origins of the term robot so when you come full circle to Afrofuturism and performers like Janelle Monáe, who we're getting to, who, who then assume the becoming android or becoming robotic identity, you have a, a kind of very interesting self-reflexive um, uh, and critical and performative relationship uh, to the term uh, robot that's almost doubled up. Now, I know we're skipping and moving quickly. Monáe? <laughs> fictional status of New World imported African Americans already. She's also saying, I'm an alien from outer space. So she's connecting the alien and the robotic and the technological. Right there, I think we have some clues as to what race as a technology starts to mean. Robots are already alienated forms of production. We can think that out of whatever kind of critical political per per perspective, Marxist or otherwise, but there's something going on there. And then the second aspect of that is she, she says, I'm a slave girl without a race. Now, I think it's a huge mistake to interpret that as a post-racial statement or a post-black statement. There's something else going on there when she says, I'm a slave girl without a race. Um, I have notes on that, exactly what I might think that might mean, but I'm gonna skip over. Kajun Rishan here, basic instructions for leading her. Um, now, what's interesting here is there's actually a track by Rizzo. Um, if you put another B in there, B L E, you get Bible, which is a way to actually break down in the five percent tradition um, what, what Bible means. Um, uh, basic instructions for leaving the earth. So here we start to um, come into the phrase becoming alien, and I think this might actually be the first time he really says becoming alien. 
when they stop setting sun off. Um, but to listen to them as we drag into another sonar system, an omniverse of over, overlapping sonar systems, which abduct you from trad audio reality, traditional audio reality. And by becoming alien himself, Ra turns you alien. I think this is part of it. The reason music is so important, and this is really addressing your point, Kevin, is music has the ability to transport you. It is a materialist metaphor. So all throughout the sort of talk I'm advancing between the sort of you know, metaphor and allegory on one side, semiotics, technology, infrastructures, uh, sort of materializations on, on the other, music is that which conjoins the two. Music hits your body as vibration. And um, actually when Eric played the beginning of Space is the Place, Ra talks about vibration. In his poetry, he talks about vibration all the time. Music is a material form. Um, Steve Goodman, otherwise known as the dubstep producer Code 9, has a great uh, book called Sonic Warfare on MP Press. He was part of the CCRU with Kajwa Shun, who are crazy the wizards in the 90s doing a whole bunch of drugs and going to jungle parties. And mm -hmm. he also really talks about the, the materialist force of music, the possibility of vibrations to actually transport and change your brain chemistry. This is what we're getting at here. If we're a materialist philosopher and we're looking for the basis of how technics and thought com like combines, music is that one of those things which really bridges um, what, what we conceive of in our various conceptual hierarchies as two distinct things, the material and the immaterial. So, <sighs> I've lost half of you. Um, <laughs> goes on to say, reject history and mythology, assemble counter mythologies, assemble to become an action program. And I think there's a lot of value from this. There's strategic political value from becoming alien because it places you outside of a number of dialectics. It removes you from the, the human, subhuman, white enlightenment, uh, you know, white enlightenment dialectic. It also removes you from referencing that um, white European philosophical tradition, um, even though we're constantly in dialogue with it, but it allows you to start building, building up some kind of other tradition of moving materialist thought around it. And my last point is, which I'm gonna summarize really quickly for Andrew, is, Sun Ra, why do we accept the madness of Sun Ra not just as madness or an allegory or a metaphor? It's an argument from faith. It's a structural argument from faith. Mm -hmm. It's because Ra has faith in himself that we accept what Ra says. Mm -hmm. To say otherwise would be to negate Ra's statements. And I think the affirmation, that open affirmation of Sun Ra is extraordinarily important. <laughs> You have to accept the other when the other comes to you. Mm. You do not deny the other and say you can't be real. No, <laughs> you say you, you are a real already. You are surreal. This is surreal. And you start from that premise. That's the philosophical argument. And this also has to do with the deeper philosophy being constitutive to every decision making and futurity that we cannot make any rational decision or a projection of the future without crossing the chasm of madness. So this is all kind of wrapped up. Um, I know this has been very quick and crazy. <laughs> but that's really about, about it. The shun goes on. I just want to get to this last poem, and I'll end my talk. So Sun Ra 1972 writes a poem about living parallel, and he says, wisdom on its abstract plans. We use myth as medium to understanding. Thus, a living parable to the outward or inward truth is every myth. And from the myth, you can see the likeness of the truth out. And if you spend a little bit of time still deciphering all that, yeah, I think it summarizes everything I've just said. I'm going over time. All right, we got about 11 minutes. Uh, so we'll open the floor for questions quicker, quicker, quicker. Anyone that has uh, any burning, yearning desires, there we go. Right down front. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> you set him up and he'll knock him down. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Um, this, 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 this is what I wrote. Where's my brain off and I wrote another tag in there. Monet's becoming alien is also a becoming android, a becoming which signals the robotic, robotic simulacra of the human. Um, so this is kind of what's getting at where Monet throws up. Carl Capek's poem of the word robot. And there's actually a video here which I think kind of gets at what she means by this. It's a video for Primetime with uh, Miguel. 
uh, where um, her alter ego is sending a letter to Android, and she's actually a, um, a stripper. Like she's a robotic or an Android stripper, and like a like all the Android performance art strippers in the Flight Club are just human customers to like come in, and she falls in love with uh, a human who's like Miguel, and then he falls in love with her, and the kiss sort of explodes, and it's obviously a transgression, and it's an allegory, and so forth. Um, but what we're really looking at here is of race and gender in the exploitive technological becoming of the android, which is this kind of a way to sort of philosophically phrase this. Um, she's a slave girl without a race because she's already a robot and a robot is already race. Right? I, I don't think she's a shearing race in that moment. I think she's actually signaling the doubling that the android always already is as a kind of race. Um, I don't want to say subject because he's an android subject, but I think it's like right there. Does that make any sense? Got a question in the back? Um, um, so I, I think I want to follow up on that. But in conversation about um, Simone and, and her identifying or performing as cyborg, rather than assuming that she comes in future, I'm thinking about the way that black women have always been seen as machines. So how, so how do we see that? I think you've nailed it. Like that's exactly what I think. Like the coining of the word robot speaks to is when Carl Kapek coined robot, he coined it specifically to speak to the history of oppression of enslaved African Americans. He had that in mind. So when he was coming up with the science fictional metaphor for slavery, he turned it into the robot. So you nailed it. Well, I would like to add, what, what, what I always think about when I listen to Mel Monet, I have to go back to my favorite, one of my favorite sci-fi writers, Phyllis K. Dick, and of course, the crazy movie they made on Squirt from Android to Love Electric. She, of course, turned into Blade Runner. That was the core of that whole movie. Because what most people miss, I, like when I was doing some crazy DJing, I would always sample the scene where uh, the android, Rachel says, well, what if I run away to Canada? <laughs> <laughs> Will you come after me? And most people miss that. Right? That that whole book was a metaphor for that hopelessness. Mm -hmm. And so Blade Runner is this aesthetic is just one of those movies that always influenced. But philosophically, what Phyllis K. Dick was dealing with was that very issue. And so when I see Janelle Monae and even Erica Badu referencing some of uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky's old films like The Mouse, <laughs> they're bringing back that kind of aesthetic. That's kind of like cult aesthetic, but they're bringing it out of pop culture. So, you know, it's always been grappling with the black man's mind. Nice question. Man, well, that's great. Uh, <laughs> right now, I'm leaving here. Uh, I'm thinking of the conversation we had in the city. I'm going to try and wrap it up with Jenna. How do you see Afrofuturism in dialogue with madness? I'm thinking of the ooze of Jakari and this idea of what Eric is on that moment, that monster. So, yeah.